All righty. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's social media feeds. My name is Patrick. I'm right here in the middle. I work at the aquarium here in social media. If anything breaks during this live stream, that will be my bad. So hello, good morning, everybody. And joining us uh, this Tuesday, as always, are some amazing folk from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute uh, social media team and tech team. Uh, and uh, directly below me on this side of the screen, here is the better half of the Monterey Bay Aquarium social media team, Emily, right there. So Emily will be uh, tackling your questions. So uh, send those in to us. We've got Cassie over here that will be answering questions over on Embari social media feeds. Susan is downstairs here. She actually has a preview of a really fun animation that is just coming out today. We'll be showing that a little bit later. Uh, but joining us right now for this very special presentation, talking about robots that explore the ocean, we have AUV uh, engineer, uh, oh, I, I, I think I butchered part of your of your title, but we've got Emery Nolasco over here on this side of the screen. Emery, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. How's everyone doing? Doing good. Emery, uh, can you uh, tell the folks what your full job title is that I completely butchered there? I had AUV engineer, but I know there's more to it. Yeah, so I'm an AUV operations engineer and that means autom autonomous underwater vehicle. Awesome. And can you tell the folks what an autonomous underwater vehicle is? I've got one here behind me in my Zoom uh, background. Uh, Cassie has hers over there as well. And so does Emily there has uh, the AUVs. And you've got AUVs in the back there. Emery, can you tell us a little bit about what AUVs are? AUV, so autonomous underwater vehicles. So autonomous means that it's able to, these robots are able to, um, make their own decisions based off of the environment that they're subject to. Um, with, unlike the ROVs, the remotely operated ve uh, vehicles, we don't have somebody operating them. They're, we throw them in the water and they go off and do their own thing based off of their programming. Awesome. Oh, super cool. So um, yeah, we're going to be talking all about that cool tech there. Uh, but before we get started, for those of you folks who may not uh, have seen one of these live streams before, we're going to introduce Mbari uh, very quickly and show off uh, a little bit about um, the the workplace that uh, that you, Emery, and, and Susan and Cassie uh, have out there. Because the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is not the physical aquarium. It is located about 20 miles north of the Monterey Bay Aquarium at the mouth of the Moss Landing uh, Harbor area, or in the Moss Landing Harbor area, I should say. Um, so you might recognize here in the background of this particular video, you can see here the research vessel, Rachel Carson, with the Moss Landing power plant there and those iconic smokestacks of the Monterey Bay area. That's where Mbari is located. Um, they have got a, many different research vessels. That's the Rachel Carson. This here is the Western Flyer. And these vessels go out to sea to study not only the deep sea, but uh, the oceans, oceanography, and uh, all the different physical characteristics, chemical characteristics, everything out there to study in the ocean. Uh, the Ambari folk are trying to do it. Aboard these vessels are ROVs, remotely operated vehicles, which you may be familiar with. Here is the ROV Doc Ricketts, named after uh, the character from John Steinbeck's Cannery Row there. Of course, it's aboard the Western Flyer. Um, and this here is the ROV Ventana, literally our window into the deep sea. That's aboard the Rachel Carson. These ROVs go down into the deep waters of the Monterey Submarine Canyon to film all of the different animals that we've shown you during these Mysteries of the Deep broadcast previously. These are the ones that are controlled by pilots that are tethered back up to the surface. And so you can see here in the Western Flyer control room there. Uh, this is kind of that classic view there of those robots exploring the deep uh, with those cameras directly back to the surface so that the scientists can watch in real time what's going on. But that can be rather difficult to, uh, or you wouldn't be able to study the entire ocean with just an ROV. You need to be able to go much further away. And so that's where Emery and her team come in. Here is one of those AUVs, an autonomous underwater vehicle. And these torpedoes of science are able to head out very far away, uh, doing their own thing, as Emery was mentioning, uh, studying the ocean uh, for long, long periods of time that humans would not be able to do. Uh, these robots don't need to sleep uh, the same as people do, and they don't get seasick. So you can put them out there into the ocean. There's that AUV being launched 
over the side. And some things that these AUVs are doing are things like mapping. And now if I can nail my transition here, I should be able to show the brand new map here uh, that these AUVs have helped us produce after decades of research. So let's see. Here we go. Here's the brand new animation that just launched today from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's team. There's Mbari right there in the center of the Monterey Bay. Uh, and that is the view there from San Holt Road looking out over the ocean. That's where some of that bioluminescence was happening recently, if you folks remember. And if you drain the bay, this is what you start seeing. Out here in the Monterey Bay, we have essentially the submarine canyon, uh, the Grand Canyon in a submarine canyon out here. It's a mile deep from rim to the bottom. And then at the deepest point, there's another mile of water stacked up above that canyon. So it can be two miles deep at its deepest point. And what you're looking at here is a meter scale resolution map there of that canyon. Imagine all the water drained out. This is what you would see. And that's thanks to those autonomous underwater vehicles and other mapping technology. Really a monumental feat of research right there. You can see there that canyon now in that beautiful, beautiful relief. And now let's see if I can nail this transition coming back. Oh, so far, no dice. Okay, here we are. We're back. All right. How did I do, Susan? Did, did I explain that pretty well? All right. I think I did okay. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> awesome. So Emery, uh, before we get to some questions from Emily, I'm sure a lot of uh, folks out there um, have those questions. But uh, Emery, your your team, they're studying the AUVs. You're helping with that with that mapping and a whole bunch of other tech that we just saw there. So we got to reveal that map there. So you've been working on these AUVs, doing doing that mapping. Can you tell us a little bit about what it's like to babysit these uh, these torpedoes before they go out there to to do their science? Yeah. So babysitting the torpedoes is an interesting phrase for it. I kind of see us as the, the pit crew for them. Gotcha. Um, so the, kind of the daily life, uh, I get asked like, what is my daily life kind of look like at my job? And it's not really a daily life. It, we have kind of two sections of like two different versions of what an AUV operations engineer goes through. We have like an onshore version and then we have an offshore version. Um, usually when we're on shore, what that looks like is we, this is our time period where we can coordinate with the scientists and put in new technologies. This is a time period where we can maintain the vehicles. Um, this is the time period where we could make, add new features to the vehicles. And then when we're offshore, it goes into this kind of pit crew um, cycle where we get the vehicle ready. It's kind of like a space launch and then we launch the vehicle into the ocean. And then when the 22, 20 to 22 hours later, we go pick up the vehicle, bring it back on, on dock or shore or on the boat and charge it, offload the data. The scientists look at the, at the data again, review it, tell us what type, where we should go with the data. Like in the, ma in the mapping case, what they'll do is they'll review the map, say, hey, that's an interesting spot. Why don't we go put the vehicle there? And then we reprogram it and then we launch it again so it's that cycle over and over again it's a 27 hour cycle awesome so i i love i love that idea of the the pit crew like it's a formula one crew bringing the the science back in maybe getting uh, the juice box there for the for the auv get it all primed up ready to go back out um emily i'm sure we've got some questions here at this point uh for emory about these auvs before we launch into some of those day in the life videos that uh that Emery, you, you shared with us. So uh, Emily, what kind of questions do the folks have? Yeah, well, something uh, kind of neat. Uh, we actually have our colleagues over on the East Coast tuning in right now. Woods Hole Oceanographic oh, Institute awesome. is, is joining us on YouTube right now. So hello, <laughs> hope everything's going well over there on the East Coast right now. Um, we did have a question though over on Twitch. People are curious what kind of language or framework do the AUVs primarily use when you operate them? So my background is in mechanical engineering. I, when it comes to operations, I know um, the basic Linux to get the vehicle up and running, to charge the vehicle. But as far as the programming, I believe it's something that we have in, in house. Gotcha. So I can't really speak to that. Yeah. 
No, I mean, that's pretty cool that it's in-house that you're using mm-hmm. that. It's proprietary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Wh- whoever wh- whoever was asking that out language. there, we see you, Woods yeah. Hole, trying to figure that. We're just kidding. <laughs> We're just kidding. And Bari is very open with all of its science and, and, and yeah. all of that stuff. But uh, yeah, but yeah, we're just going to keep that on the DL. That's our, if we've got yeah. competing AUV yeah. companies up now. Totally you could kidding. say that it's our secret. <laughs> right? There it was. Yeah. There we go. I had to get one pun in already this time. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, Emery, uh, I'm going to see about pulling up some of those those videos there. Uh, which one do you want me to play first there to kind of show people what it's like for the the pit crew uh, for the science there aboard aboard the ship? Which one do you want me to play first here? Why don't we do it the point of view from the launch? OK, point of view from the launch. So that would be POV mapper launch. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Cool. All right. Pulling that up right now. And let me see. All right, go for it. You're picture in picture with the launch. Uh, Let's see. Um, So is is the GoPro on you right now? (laughs) The GoPro is on me. Um, Give me a second. I can't see the video. Oh, no worries. So I'll I'll let you know. We're we're now exiting onto the deck. We're on the deck now. We're walking towards the, we're walking towards the, the, the launch area. So what is it like at sea at, at this point? You've got folks getting prepped over there. Yeah. Okay. So the vehicle weighs about a ton. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, one of the benefits of having a di- diverse group of people is we have people at different heights. So one of, as you see in the video, uh, this boat is really moving. Um, we have, we can have upwards of waves of like 10 to 18 feet. And you can see that there's a lot of splashing on board. So it's helpful to have some people who are really tall who can control the vehicle at all times as it's getting launched off of the boat. Um, and then we have, like, I think, sorry, this is a little hard for me to see. Yeah, no worries. So you, you've just you've just put one of the straps back in the in the lab here. So now we're back here on the deck, and mm. it is it is really rolling right now. Um, we can see. Yeah, you get to launch your AUVs in a little bit more uh, difficult environment than the than the ROVs tend to go, right? Yes, yes. So that's one of the benefits of, of launching off the Rachel Carson. We, I have in the two and a half years that I've been um, with Embari, I've gotten to launch off of um, catamarans and boats that have are higher off the water. And the Rachel Carson is really nice because we can go, you know, we can launch in at sea like 20, 28 knots and with high waves and because it's all it is is pick up the vehicle and put it in the ocean and we can we have minimal uh contacts we just have like maybe three people depending on how um how bad the weather is awesome and we right now we've got a gentleman who's just hooked up uh the crane arm so the crane arm is swinging over and now you're you're walking towards uh towards the AUV there on, on the side. So uh, walk us through how, how are we moving? The, is this a giant game mm. of claw um, we're about to about to play here? Yes, so so on the part of, um, I get a lot of questions on, is that a magnet? Uh, the vehicle is, mm. not mo- is mostly made out of plastic, so there's not a lot of magnetic material to launch from or hold on to. What it is, is a, it's a hook you, um, being pre- and the hook presses it against that kind of rubber tire like crane crane um, picking point. Yep. And what we're doing is we have a hook with a messenger line, and that messenger line allows us to pull the hook once the vehicle's in the water, and that's how we launch it. It's also the same way that we recover it as well. Awesome. So we see a few folks there prepping the hook there, and so the this mapper too. Can you tell us a little bit about what this AUV does? This mapper makes, um, it takes, it does seafloor mapping and we do, we map everywhere from underwater volcanoes, tectonic plates, we look at the sediment layers, we've found like hydrothermal vents. Uh, What is cool about it is it does meter scale resolution. One of the really cool aspects of this and how I really like incorporating the whole teamwork of um, working in oceanography is that we'll have boats uh, make these large kind of low resolution maps. And then we'll scale down and we'll use these AUVs that are able to do a wide wide swath of an area, but do meter scale resolution. And then from there, a scientist can go and look and say, hey, there are some really interesting aspects in that. Can we zoom in on that? And they'll go ahead and launch the ROV into that area and we're able to get video 
or maybe higher resolution, um, we have a, a project that we use a LIDAR where we get centimeter scale resolution oh. you know, from the ROV. Cool. Uh, LIDAR, um, I, I think a lot of folks out there, there's just so many different so many different bits of, of mapping going in right now. Um, so we have uh, some straps being wrapped around the AUV. Oh, the AUV is up. It's mm -hmm. about it's swinging around right now and about to head over. So what what's the most uh, um, heads up moment for you when you're out here on, on the deck when this is happening? So one thing. So, again, again, this vehicle weighs a lot. It you know weighs about a ton and it's very long. Uh, we want to make sure that we, uh, one of the reasons why this point of view is strapped to my um, my life jacket and not my head is because I'm constantly scanning. We're constantly trying to be situationally situationally aware of what everything is going on because we don't want anybody to get hurt. Safety is first. Um, so we go. So everybody is aware. Um, we have the straps on there because again we want to be control controlled. We have control of the vehicle the entire time. So as you can tell, we always have something holding onto it, maybe two contact points. So awesome. those are things, yeah. and then when you're on the dock too, you also wanna be aware of your surroundings because you don't wanna be in any squish points. Yeah, squish points sounds <laughs> sounds like a place that nobody ever wants to be in, uh, certainly. Uh, all right, well, it looks like the AUV got launched here over the side. Um, Let's see, Emily. We've got we've got some questions here. Uh, definitely the let, I think we should get to the Woods Hole question. Yeah, uh, it's there. a good one. It's a very good yeah. question. So, Emery, we've got we've got a question for you from Woods Hole. Yeah. So there is a saying uh, that goes, "Never put anything in the ocean that you can't afford to lose." So, Emery, how does it feel when one of your babies <laughs> goes over the side of the boat for a mission? So I've always, when it comes to ocean research, um, I've only known the life of, 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 an a, of operating AUVs. I haven't operated with an ROV, which is tethered to the boat. And if something goes back, you know, wrong, you can, you can pull it in. Um, I have talked to ROV uh, personnel and they, they have showed me, they have expressed like, how do you, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> knowing that, that, you know, your robot is off running, you know, in the ocean somewhere, because it is the large space um, and to lose it. But we have a lot of redundancies in our systems. You know, if it's, uh, and when it's on top, we have two different Iridium uh, systems that will email us. So if one is down, the other one will email us and they're on a backup battery. Uh, we, uh, on top of those, when I say e it'll email us, it'll email us the GPS coordinates and then approximate, like it's within a two mile radius of this GPS coordinate. Um, another system that we have when it's on top of the surface is uh, our RDF, which is a radio direction fire finder. So it sends out a signal, like a beep, and uh, on the boat we have an omnidirectional. So it's looking, it's scanning 360, looking, listening for the sound, and it'll tell us what direction it is. Um, that's a one that we can only listen for a one mile around the boat. Uh, we have a Yagi, which is a longer range one, which is three miles away that we can listen for three miles away. And it's just like this giant antenna. Yes. Um, that we will take and we'll, we'll put on headphones and list and scan the ocean for it. Uh, if it's on the bottom, if it's underwater, uh, we do have a pinger that we can listen to with the hydrophone. Uh, here in the Monterey, in, in the Monterey Bay, we also have a plane that's set up to listen for the vehicle as well. So worst case scenario, um, those are all of our redundant systems. We don't want to lose it. And there was a lot of testing that was done before we started launching the, the vehicles. It was kind of, I, I've talked to some of the uh, boat guys and they were saying how they watched it grow up and they saw the first time it was seen as strapped to the RV and they were testing out the vehicle and taking its first steps. And the first time they put it on the ocean on its own. So it's, it's a really cool development. That's awesome. I'm playing uh, here some video there in the background of uh, of part of the recovery, not the POV of the recovery, but uh, mm -hmm. there's 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 the baby coming home there. Um, <laughs> going uh, back to you, Emily, what kind of questions uh, do we have? Yeah, no, I mean, that kind of leads into the next question that people had, which was how do you get them back out of the water and have you ever lost one of the AUVs at sea? I've 
So I've only been here for um, two and a half years in the time that I was here. The closest that we got to losing it was one day, one morning, it wasn't, it was, we had like a six hour gap where it wasn't giving us GPS and we had gone through all of these systems where this was before we had a redundant um, Iridium that sent us the email to get mm. the GPS coordinates. So we weren't getting that, we weren't, we weren't, so we didn't know where, and it, since it was six hours, we weren't sure. So the longer time that we we're not getting a signal, the more error, that the less we know where it is. Um, so this is another part of where we tap it into our like an oceanography, you know, where is the current going? Um, so we got the, we got the boat out there. We started launching the, the plane and we finally got a, a hit on, on their RDF, the radio direction finder. We got, a, we heard the beep. And, and then we had everybody on deck with their binoculars and we saw it. And on the antenna, there was a seagull sitting on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Did uh, you... It was just trying to write its its new newest book, Gulliver's Travels, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It al <laughs> also feels like maybe that seagull, if you checked the insignia, could have also been, uh, you know, from from a deep sea canyon that didn't want to be mapped, you know, just uh, a little, <laughs> a little disruptive goes, there. And Maybe it was Woods Hole. Yeah, yeah Woods Hole again, sent no, the just, seagull Wood, over Woods here. Woods Hole, yeah. you, you should never have come onto this chat. We're just going to blame you for all of the shenanigans that happened out there. <laughs> but awesome. Emery, did you get a picture of the seagull on the, on the antenna? Because that is social media gold. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, gold, yeah. you you meant to say right? G U L L D. Gold, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, awesome. Uh, Emery, I wanted to to ask here um, if should we play that other POV video that uh, that you had? Is that is this the good time for that? Yeah, that'd be great. All right, uh, here, stand by. Um, here, let me put. Whoops, hold on. Let me just put everybody else there up on the screen, so it's not just you looking blankly out there. Maybe uh, Emily, do you have a, a question real quick? Emery can answer while I line up that video. Yeah, absolutely. We've gotten lots of questions so far. So uh, Emery, typically when you are launching these AUVs, is it just here in the Monterey Canyon? How far away have you traveled to be able to launch these AUVs? Wow, there's, so the program has been, is older than 15 years old. Um, I've, again, I've only been here for two and a half years. And the time period that I've been here, I've I went to the Gulf of California. We've gone to San Diego. There's an underwater volcano off the coast of Oregon that we go to. So I've been to a lot of places and it's been really exciting. I've also heard from previous coworkers that it's been to Greenland and the Arctic. Wow. So it's worldwide. Yeah, it's amazing. Very cool. All right, I have uh, the video lined up here, Emery, for you. So this is uh, the full recovery and the charging, and I'm going to hit play right now. All right, walk us through it. What do we What do we see in here? We've got all right the video buffering. Here we go. It's it's coming back on deck. Okay, great. So once we I've I've gone through the way that we recover the vehicles. And once we find the vehicle, the captain will line itself up with the AUV, but also keeping in mind of, you know, how the waves are and trying to protect the people that are on, on the, the boat. Uh, we can't do this without these guys. They're, they're, rock, they're the superstars, the show. Um, so here we have, you see, we have a hook hanging out. And attached to that hook that's underneath the crane is a messenger line. This is, this is almost the reverse of what, how we launched the vehicle. Um, and what the goal of this is, is not to get just the hook hooked into that other hook, right? Um, we can just get, we can just get the messenger line through the first hook and then pull it through. Mm. Um, we have guys on the side with, um, these boat poles to just make sure that the vehicle doesn't bump into the boat. Uh, we want to, again, we, the less things that we break in the process, the easier our jobs are. So here we are. I think the captain is lining up the boat with the AUV. And so, uh, just a quick question, you know, for for my uh, for my interest, uh, did you ever get seasick uh, before you started working on these on these things? I'm sure a lot of folks out there are just watching the rocking back and forth and kind of 
wondering what it, what it's like to work at sea when you're you know you have to be intently focused on on something and not just staring at the horizon hoping not to not to feed not to feed the ocean I get yeah I get this question a lot I used to be I, I'm still a diver um, and I thought when I went diving it, that was you know the small boats with the the bumpy waves that that was extreme and I was able to handle that as long as I didn't have coffee and you mm -hmm. know sugary treats in the morning uh, as as far as working on the boat I, I definitely have gotten more resilient when it comes to seasickness uh, there have been times where the boat's really moving and then there's nobody who feels good and uh, but I've also found some coping mechanisms um, drink ginger tea wear noise canceling headphones don't read so the people that I think our superstars are our programmers mm. <laughs> when they're able to look at the tiny font and concentrate that while the boat is moving that is oh, that's man. amazing i'm already feeling queasy just thinking about that so uh looks like the uh auv is now up on the crane nestled up against the the rubber padding there now it's going to swing mm -hmm. over so uh what's going through your mind at this point at this point in time we want to make sure that we have the straps ready to go because once once they're able to, um, we get, they're going to swing it over. There are going to be a couple of people ready to grab, take a hold of the vehicle. So they have control of it. And then we have a couple of people who have on straps and they're going to strap the vehicle. Once the, the vehicle is strapped down, we can go ahead and unhook it from the crane, um, and start going through the recovery, uh, motions where we start downloading the date, offloading the data pulling out the battery chargers, um, cleaning up the sensors, taking out the sensor so we can down also offload the data. Awesome. Here we go. Yeah, we see the straps coming on right now. Mm -hmm. And you can see there's somebody always hold, having a hold on the vehicle at all times. In case the AUV decides to go right back out for another run real quick. Like, I think I got more in me, coach. Put bit. me back yeah. in. <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah. And so, uh, what does the charging look like, uh, recharging everything is gotta be some interesting ports there to be able to handle the, the seawater and everything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we have these, uh, everything in our vehicle is water, like not, we try to waterproof our vehicle since it's going out into the ocean. Yeah. Um, so all of the, the connectors for the batteries is they have a cap that has, has two seals in it that keeps it out. And then these tethers that we're bringing out, those also have the same one. So we try, like, especially when it's rocky, I try to make sure that no water gets in, in the connector while I'm taking off the caps. And then, then we go ahead and connect them. And those all have O-rings in them. So once everything's connected, um, it's all waterproof. So we don't have to worry about that. And it takes about five hours to charge, depending on how low it is. Okay. Interesting. And... We, we've thought about, you know, maybe if we put, you know, bigger cables, um, maybe it'll charge faster, but that's about how much time it takes for the data to offload and the scientists decide what to do where, you know, where our next point is supposed to be. Gotcha. I love the idea of recharging the, the scientific robot, just like <laughs> it's coming, <laughs> it's coming back on the boat. Just like, did I do good? Just like, yeah, here, here's some, here's some juice there. Uh, let's mm -hmm. see. Let's get the rest of us back up here on screen real quick. Um, Emily, what uh, what kind of questions do the do the folks We've have? We've gotten out there? a lot of really great questions so far from from our audience tuning in right now. Um, Emery, a lot of folks are curious, just how long are these missions that you're sending these AUVs out for? So are they very short missions, just a couple of hours? Are they days long, weeks long, years long? What does it look like for one of these ROVs out there in the ocean before it has to come back and recharge? Mm. So we have, uh, compared to our long range AUV, um, I guess, do we have, we have, we have a, a, another set of AUVs that we have here and those are long range. Ours only go out for 20 to 22 hours at the most. We do have day trips that, you know, if we're just testing out the sensors, we want to make sure that everything's working okay. You know, maybe they'll be, um, we'll drop it in the water, wait about six hours and then pick it back up. It, d it depends on what type of mission we want. Gotcha. I'm playing some long range AUV video behind you, FYI. 
Um, another question that we got uh, was given how useful these autonomous underwater vehicles are, why don't we see more of them out in the ocean? Why aren't they out there all the time? Mm. That's a good question. Um, I think I think that plays into the idea that we're still we're still doing a lot of research on these vessels. Like um, the long range AUVs, I, I think the idea is that we'll eventually get them so they're more widespread. They're also very expensive right now because they're still, you know, we're still on that cutting edge. So we can't just launch a ton of them. Um, we ha still have limited resources. Another is that, you know, we're, I don't, I'm not sure as far as like, it would be great if we had a fleet mechanism or a way that we can automatically charge these vehicles. So maybe we don't need as many, we can um, have less operators per how many AEVs there are. Um, it's, it, we only have five people on our team and we have four vehicles that we are constantly running and it's already a lot, you know, for just our team. Right. That's such a, that's such an interesting thing to, to think about. You know, we can kind of think about these AUVs, long range AUVs as sort of like, you know, satellites just out there going out into the ocean and there's enough satellites in space that it can be a nuisance to people that are, that are star gazing, but then um, the the hurdles of technology that it takes to put these satellites out into into our world uh, in the ocean, uh, there's there's a handful of them, like, like you were saying there. So, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully one of these days we can get enough, not that they're a nuisance, but enough AUVs out there that we can actually track what's going on out there uh, in the ocean. I don't know, uh, Susan, yeah. if you wanted to, to speak to some of that technology there, or uh, we can move on to an, another question. Well, yeah, I'll just add that we definitely, I mean, that is the goal of Mbari is to have, um, you know, this fleet of robots that are allowing us to study the ocean throughout, you know, and cover more, more water than we would be able to with just instruments over a boat. And so it, but of course, as Emery really pointed out, we have these limited resources and limited staff to actually deal with all of the robots and resources. So there are a lot more companies um, and other oceanographic institutions that are working with AUVs as well. Right. So in the chat, if we could just get some W's, some high fives uh, digitally to Emery <laughs> over here and, and crew for doing all of uh, that amazing work. Pioneers out there in, in the in the world of, of ocean exploration. So let's, let's get those, let's get those GGs going in the, in the chat there. I would like to add that when we, when we're also talking about limited resources, you, you know, we talk about, yeah, these, you know, take up resources and, you know, why, why put in the effort towards, towards these robots? Well, if you think about it, um, the same data that we gather, like if we were to take a boat or an RV to go and map the ocean floor, it wouldn't, it would cost, way more time and money to to do the same thing as an AUV. Um, one of one, one example that I really like to give is um, our Gulper vehicle. It's a water sampling vehicle that um, gets water samples, like liter water samples. And it also does like CTD data, salinity, depth, temperature, and bioluminescence. But this was something that what they would do is they would launch a um, a sensor package and a rosette off the side of a boat. So with the, on the boat, you know, we have a boat's crew, we have the scientists, it's a whole day thing and they're only able to go to a certain amount of locations. Whereas now we have this AUV and it only takes three people to launch the vehicle. You have the, the boat operator on the small, on a small boat to tow the AUV out into the canyon and you have the two AUV operators. And then we go drop it off and then come back home. And then the next day we go pick it up. And then on the dock, we have all those water samples and the data is for the scientists and the scientists don't you know, have to go out there. They can use their time um, and their resources to be working on something else. That's so this is a... Mm -hmm. No, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing stuff. Um, Emily, more questions about that. 
Yeah, no, that brought up a, a great question of exactly what are these AUVs measuring when they're down the deep sea? We kind of talked about um, how some of them are mapping the ocean floor, uh, but are they doing anything else when they're out there, Emery? Yes. So this is where we, I, I had mentioned earlier that we have four different AUVs. Two of them are mapping vehicles that do sea floor, floor mapping, and we have two others. Uh, we have one that's the I-2 map. And what that does is it, instead of um, it maps, it maps the biology that's in the water. So it takes, it has a giant eye in the front of it with these lights and it takes a video. And this is one way that we can look, count, you know, what animals are out there in, in the ocean and without having to drag, you know, a net and pull them out of the water and see what they look like then. So we see them in situ and Another thing that we have on there is we have a sonar package, so we can look at them acoustically. And um, those are two different types of data that we take on that vehicle. Uh, the other vehicle that we have is what I mentioned earlier is the gulper vehicle that does the water samples. And it's like a water sampler's dream. Um, <laughs> so uh, just, sorry, Emery, real quick, I was a little bit behind you there. I have the IMAP uh, up on screen right now with the big eyeball there on the front with the, with yes. the cameras being launched right now. So <laughs> I'll go to the gulper, but tell us a little bit more about the IMAP. I, I got the video up a little bit late, sorry. This is this is great too, because I think this is where it. Uh, we had talked to, you know, Ben, we got a little life view into the life of an RV pilot in an earlier video. What what is different between our lives is that they have these giant cameras, you know, they're, you're, they're, they're pilots, so they're remoting the vehicle, so they see exactly what the vehicle sees. And only one of our vehicles has a camera on it. So from our, from our perspective, you know, all we see is the code that we're, you know, launching the vehicle with, and then that's it. So the IT map brings a cool view of, we can actually see what our AUV sees when it's in the water. That's really fun. It's got yeah, this this does bring up a very um important question though because we have a lot of uh new fans of this imap or our, our, our auv uh with that big eyeball in the front there makes it look really charismatic emory do you name the auvs the way that we name our rovs at ambari um hmm. we kind of go by i think only one of our vehicles ha has a name uh which is dl and b which is the mapper one we have it named Mapper 2. I2 Map is an acronym. And I think the CTD vehicle is named Gulper, which makes sense. It's gulping yeah. up water. <laughs> I think I finally. Right, well, sorry, I finally found the photo. I think that we photo. need to take suggestions of, of what, what do we name this adorable little robot with its eye? Oh, I think yeah. <laughs> I'm almost there. I'm almost there, uh, Emily and Emery. You gave me enough time. Okay. Let, let me see. I think. <laughs> I think well, I, I can got ask it. more questions. Here you go. There's there's our lots. little cutie. There's a little cutie. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> what does it look like? What, what let, let's get some name suggestions in the chat there, everybody. <laughs> awesome. Um, Emery, we did have another question here. Uh you know, these AUVs are doing so much. We have some that are, you know, mapping the seafloor. So they're going down here in the canyon, you know, two miles deep. How do we build a robot like this to withstand the crushing pressure and everything else that the deep sea has to offer uh, to keep that robot safe so that we can do these amazing scientific experiments? That's an, I like that how you said everything else that the ocean has to offer because it is <laughs> it's not just the pressure that we're dealing with. I, I get I work on the mechanical engineering side. So one of the nice things about having, uh, the AEV, which is like majority plastic and, you know, the metal parts are not together is that, you know, there's, um, there's a, a reaction that happens when you have dissimilar metals together that make it almost one corrodes the other, like a battery. I mean, yeah. Um, wow. So that's, some, that's a, a, a factor that I have to think about when I'm designing. Um, when it comes to this, so the AUV is a lot like the ROVs in the sense of we have pressure housings. We use a lot of the same stuff. Just now we have the added, you know, brains um, to be able to do their its own missions. And so we have pressure housings. So we have three. We have three different types of pressure housings on our AUV. We have one that's a glass sphere, and it's kind of like it's two hemispheres, and it's just it's like an egg. It's using it has a vacuum on the inside. 
and you know has all the pressure of the ocean on the outside and it keeps everything on the side dry. Um, we have another one which is like a titanium or an aluminum pressure housing, which is a cylinder and it has O-rings. And then we have oil filled ones which the idea behind that is you have the oil will be the same pressure as it is on the outside of the seawater. And like all the tubes will, we have compensators and tubes that if they squeeze, that's how it, it equalizes the pressure on both sides. That's all. I'm, uh, I, I'm about to show here the midsection of the gulper. Uh, if that, yeah. I, ha I currently have the battery sphere up there behind you. Um, but here's mm -hmm. that midsection of the gulper. Uh, is that related to your your pressure housings there? It isn't. It is. It is a Aha, sensor perfect. packaging. Perfect. Well done, yes. Pat. Perfect transition. <laughs> but what can you tell us about the insides of the gulper now that it's behind you there? It's. Yeah, this is where I was saying that we're able to get. You know, it's a water sampler's dream, right? Instead of going out there with it, you know, on a boat, get the ros rosette down there and bringing it back up, we have a bunch of these little pistons that. Uh, gulp up water samples at different parts in, in the canyon and we can just bring them back and give them to the scientists and they can do their um, their science on it. Awesome. Uh, and it looks from the chat here, uh, Emery and Emily, that we may have some suggestions mm -hmm. for names. Yeah, a, a lot of folks were, were saying, oh, it needs to be named like after a minion. But I, I'm, I'm particularly fond of uh, the suggestion of Mike Wazowski for Monsters Inc. with the big <laughs> eye on the front there. That was a good one. I, yeah, I I've seen it. I've seen that in multiple platforms. Yeah. A lot of people <laughs> have said that. And I also just want to chime in with what I2MAP actually stands for. I had to look it up, <laughs> but it stands for Investigations of Imaging for Midwater Autonomous oh, Platform. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nicely yeah. done. Yeah. But here Mario and Bari is notorious for acronyms. <laughs> so you match and Bari and and the aquarium both. Yeah. So the, you match our puns to the acronyms. <laughs> uh, here, uh, well, so then introducing to the world unofficially, Mike. Mike Wazowski. Wazowski. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Wazowski. Awesome. Okay. Great. Thank you, chat. Uh, Emily, more questions. <laughs> Yeah, um, this is actually a, a, another interesting one. Uh, a lot of folks were curious, why are they all bright yellow? And uh, do we have to paint them often to keep them that bright yellow? Or do you ever change up the colors? So they're bright yellow. Um, but this is actually, so this actually plays into, we, you know, we have limited resources. Uh, this is actually, I believe it's a military, the outside is from the Dorado 2021. It's, it's a military, a style vehicle that we were just, we modified so that we can do science with it instead of what the military would do with it. Um, and another nice thing about this is that we don't have to redesign something that's already been designed. We already know that it works. And the one thing that you'll notice with all the vehicles is they're, they're kind of Lego style, right? We want to make, there's only five of us. So we want to make sure that the vehicles are as similar to each other as possible. Um, and the reason why they're yellow, they're not painted yellow. That's just, that's the color of the plastic. Um, we don't, the vehicles, uh, yeah, it's a plastic shell and that goes into, it's, it's neutrally buoyant um, instead of, and when I, when I also told you earlier that I, I like it because it's majority, mostly plastic because I don't have to deal with corrosion issues. Gotcha. Yeah. Makes sense. And we'll also add that the that yellow it's yellow so that it's more visible should it oh, yeah. should it get lost at yeah. <laughs> yes we I there have been times where yeah you know beforehand even though it's yellow and it's 18 feet it's still long it's so hard to find it in the ocean so we'll we'll go out there with like um I I may need decals for the our vehicle that are holographic reflective. So that way, when we we're find, trying to find it at night and we have the giant boat lights, we can actually see it because oh, we only awesome. have one strobe on the AV. So just oh. just like anybody out there heading out on, on a bike ride at night, get that safety yellow vest on with the reflectors <laughs> or construction vest, uh, be extra safe out there. Yeah, um, definitely. That's awesome. Uh, I just I wanted to ask Emery real quick. Sorry, just related to the plastic shell and things like that. Have you ever had large animals come and investigate 
uh, your um, your AUVs because that was recently in, in the news that there was uh, uh, maybe a large a large fish interested in uh, in checking your scientific data aboard the AUV, right? Mm, but with the LR AUV? Yes. So this is this this is the thing too is um, it's hard since it, there's no like video on some of ours it's hard to know what happens to it so that's that's one of the fun aspects of my job is you know the video call comes back on board and like what adventure did you go on who did you meet who you know <laughs> um, we do have some evidence that there are other vehicles that I mean not other vehicles other animals have investigated and we sometimes have stowaways like little fish and sometimes jellyfish show up um seaweed so but occasionally have, and have you ever uh to be more direct uh has a has anyone ever taken a bite out of your out of your robots no i think okay. it, I, I would imagine an 18 compared to the lrv lauvs this one's a lot bigger so gotcha. maybe it's a little bit more intimidating but, but we've had like sea lions jump on them okay <laughs> So yours are not the ones that have been bit by the sharks then out here in Monterey. That's the long range AUV team. Mm -hmm. The small long range AUVs have multiple times now been <laughs> taken a little taste by a white shark. Just, just a little as a treat. Mm -hmm. just, 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 just to take a look. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> is that, is that a competition between the AUV teams that uh, mine is, mine is too big to be considered prey or that mine is cool <laughs> enough to be bit by a shark? <laughs> That is, it is a really cool feature. Maybe we should start that. Maybe we should have a wall, a tally mark of, you know, what wildlife is interested in our vehicles. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Shark Week certainly came and went there with, uh, with the long range AUVs. Okay. Uh, Emily, more questions from the folks out there. Yes. Um, another really interesting question kind of about the challenges that these uh, AUVs are facing in the deep sea. Emery, how far off the bottom are the AUVs from the, the seafloor when they're mapping the topography? And how does it look for obstacles in front of it? What is, how is it interacting with that seafloor there? I, I believe it's 50 meters. I'll have to double check to make sure that's, that's correct. Uh, we, it is able to show, um, when it is off the bottom, it is able to say, hey, I want to stay this far away from the bottom. We don't have object and voyage in, in the front of it. One of This is one of the challenges when it comes to autonomous vehicles is you want to make them as predictable as possible. Uh, if you want to give them the ability to make decisions on, hey, maybe I should avoid this, may, that's another aspect of complexity because that's maybe it's a characteristic that we don't know of yet. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that yeah. was great. Yeah. Awesome. I was trying to pull up an image uh, during that time there. I didn't I didn't manage. But uh, what I'll do is I'll highlight <laughs> myself here real quick and just point out there. There's the graphic of what it might look like. Hold on. Let me duck out of the way. So I one thing I guess to add is, you know, why don't we have object avoidance when it comes to AUVs because they're navigating the ocean. Again, this goes into what I had mentioned earlier, where we usually have lower resolution maps of the seafloor bottom. And so beforehand, we check to make sure that, you know, we're not going to run into anything if that's the case. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I think I may have figured out how to get that image back up there. But in the meantime, Emily, another question. <laughs> Um, we did have a great question here, Emery, for you. What's the most challenging thing that you have encountered as your career as an AUV engineer? Oh, there's there's a lot. It's a lot of different aspects. Um, one of the things is when you're at, one of the things I really like about it actually is that when you're out at sea, sometimes you have 10 megabyte bits of data that you can use, megabytes of data that you can use. So you don't have Google to search for anything. You have everything that's on the boat. And to play into more of that is my job is if something, my job is essentially make something stick to another thing. Um, and if some like a bracket breaks or you know maybe one of the fairing cracks, I'm limited to what's on the boat. I can't go and get a McMaster car order or you know go to Home Depot to find a replacement. I have to work with what's available to me. 
Wow, I hadn't. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about yeah. that. It's giving me anxiety just thinking about what's the worst. <laughs> what's the worst thing that's broken uh, that you've had to fix so far? Um, I feel like when it when it when you say worst thing, it's I is the, the most exciting thing. I think I feel like everything's just a, a little bit of a challenge. So it's hard to say like what is the worst thing? Is it the fairing? Is it um, like a, a nose bail? Is it? That's hard to say what it is. But a lot of things. It's it's it, you know it is the ocean. It is a it is a harsh place. And um, when it comes to this type of stuff, and I think constantly um, things are inevitably going to break. So it's nice to have that challenge of how do I fix it and how to replace it. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Emily, more, more questions for Emery. Maybe I've, I'm playing the uh, launch yeah. POV <laughs> video again. Mm -hmm. um, we cool. did have a, a question for you, Emery. Do you have of the, the four AUVs uh, there? Do you have a favorite? Ooh. Do I have a favorite? Uh oh! You have to pick Ooh. one of your children. <laughs> going to cause some workplace strife there. That's ho hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they're not watching. <laughs> oh man mm. this is hard because when it comes to the mapping vehicles i like them because it you, you know them usually means we're going out to sea on a long you know month-long trip and during that time period this is a you know our scientist dave Cress will go ahead and he'll he'll print out pictures of the seafloor maps as we make them and sometimes there's really interesting features and I really like the kind of adventure aspect of going on the boat and, you know, it's, it's, it's 24 hour ops. So, you know, sometimes you launch it in the morning and sometimes we launch it at night or tw twilight. And every time we launch these, I always have that kind of reflective time period of this feels like a rocket launch because mm. I have, I have my headphones on, you know, it's twilight, you see the stars out and, you know, on your headphones are like, all right, vehicle systems check. You know, sonar is on. Um, you know, is the telecone is the telecone on? You know, which way is the tel going? And it's it's such it's it's one of those moments where I'm like, this is why I do my job. It's it's very exciting. We're on the you know we're exploring this ocean and we're getting collecting learning more about it. Um, when it comes to like the I2 map, I really like the I2 map because it has a, a camera in front of it and it's. You know that goes plays into what the futures could possibly be. you know maybe with this video we can develop a neural net that can identify these creatures and maybe one day the aev can tell us hey i saw this really cool vampire squid come out come out here and check this out oh whoa and i like again i like the gulper because it does make it's it's kind of the epitome of how how we're able to use leverage technology to make science uh, cheaper and easier to do um that that's so cool here i'm putting up right now a photo of you looking very proud with one of your oceanographic uh oceanographic um children there this is you uh uh with one of the one of the auvs there at sea mm -hmm. so we'll just say that that one's your that one's your favorite there that could be mike or <laughs> i think or that was else. like that was the dl and b it was mapper one okay good job mapper one <laughs> excellent Okay, well, um, I don't want to uh, to rush anyone, but we're we're coming up on four minutes here to the to the hour, so I think uh, it's time for some rapid fire uh, questions here, Emily and Emery. I don't yes. know if you're ready. Yeah, ready. All right, uh, Emery, what is uh, you know, the favorite thing that you have ever seen with uh, the AUVs or on one of your missions out to sea? Probably that seagull. <laughs> <laughs> the disrupting seagull. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay, quick fire questions about the AUVs themselves. Um, for folks who might have missed the beginning of the stream, Emery, how big are the AUVs? Depending on the vehicle, they're about 18 feet long and it's limited to the size of a shipping container. There you go. Um, how how far out can these AUVs go untethered to the boat? Oh, that's a difficult one because it's saying like, how deep is it going to? Cause it takes energy mm -hmm. for it to go deep. So I'm, I'm gonna say 
20 to 22 hours, you know, depending on how deep or far it wants to go. How fast do the AUVs go? Six knots. All right. Well, well, I'll Google that and tell you what that is in miles <laughs> per hour, everyone. Hold on. <laughs> um, okay. Well, yeah, if, while you could, I'm if you could untangle, that, yeah. if you could untangle that real quick, uh, yeah, I'll, Emily, I'll, I'll the knots. untangle that one real quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did have another question um, about the AUVs here. So, how deep can they go? We know that they can go two miles mm -hmm. in in our canyon. Have they gone deeper? So, this. We, so the vehicles are going to be different as far as pressure ratings because it's, it's dependent on how deep the sensors that you put in it are. Uh, and overall, we, we say that they could go six, um, six kilometers deep. Um, and, but the deepest that I've ever witnessed them go is uh, 3,800 meters. All right. All right, uh, we're back with an update on the knots to miles per hour here. Uh, six knots is about 6.97 miles per hour um, or 11.1 .1 kilometers an hour for everyone who's on the metric system there. Um, and, and Emily, 3,800 meters is 12,467 feet, which is pretty yeah. impressive. Yeah, just over two miles there, which is amazing. Yeah, that's, it's still just incredible to, to think that that's just the average depth of the ocean out there. No big deal. You know, no big deal. Just two miles deep, just just a few, you know, 12,000 feet of water above it there. <laughs> um, what, are there any differences uh, between these, uh, you know, trying to pilot one of these AUVs um, underwater than say like creating um, a, uh, a robot up in the air? Oh, yes. So I actually, this goes into my background. I used to work on, on drones, um, on small un unmanned vehicles. And the difference is when you're in the ocean, you get like, when you have an aerial vehicle, um, you can see it crash. And you can see <laughs> when it falls, you can go and recover it. Right? When it, you don't, you don't want a, a, a underwater vehicle to sink. Uh, another thing is with, with aerial vehicles, you, you have telemetry. Uh, not telemetry, but you have like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and um, a radio signal. Once it gets under the ocean, we don't have any of that. So we use sonar to speak to the vehicle. So that's one of the, that's another one of the challenges. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, it has officially hit noon. So we always like to end the streams with uh, one more question. Emerine, and we ask this of everyone um, who's been joining us for these awesome streams with Mbari here. Um, for you, how did you get to be a mechanical engineer and specifically a mechanical engineer working on these amazing underwater robots? And do you have any advice for someone who might be watching this stream right now and thinking, that sounds really cool. I want that job. Yes. So the benefit now is, so I went through kind of a weird, like a, not a weird way, but a probably non-traditional way. When I was in high school, uh, this job didn't, well, it probably existed, but it wasn't something that they advertised, right? I knew I wanted to be in robotics and I really liked fish back in the day. I still like fish. Um, <laughs> and it got to the point where I saw my career going in the, in, you know, aerial vehicles, uh, unmanned, unmanned aerial vehicles. And I got to the point where I, I emailed Mbari RV and AUV personnel. And I said, Hey, I really want to get into this. How do I get into it? And they, uh, one of, so not only do you want to be, um, proficient in like some type of engineering, but it is helpful to know how well you do on a boat and, um, also understand working with scientists. So during that time period, after I had asked them and they gave me that advice, uh, I started volunteering in Southern California with local biologists and started scuba diving and volunteering to count uh, different types of fish off the coast of California. Um, for now, the benefit is they actually have robotics um, degrees at this now. And I'm like, I think my advice is there's, there's different aspects of, of my job. There's operations, there's mechanical engineering, there's electrical engineering, there's computer engineering, um, there's network and 
embedded systems. All of those all of those skills are something that you can look into and specialize in and just have a little bit of familiarity of everything else. Um, but those are fields that you can dive into that you can get into this with. Awesome. And then uh, we just had one, I think, follow up is what is it like to be a woman in uh, in your in your field studying uh, or working with all of these uh, these amazing study uh, bits of technology there. What's it like to be you out there on, at, at sea? It, yeah, a lot, there have been times where I was the only woman on board and it kind of goes into another reason, another passion of mine of, again, like, you know, um, there aren't that many women. And every time I'm out there, I say, you know, I'm, I'm normalizing this. I'm making it accessible. I'm showing that this is something that, you know, women have the ability to do and i can guide other people into the same field and it would be great to have more women in our field nice do you have any words of wisdom yes be be confident in what you you are knowledgeable about uh, be curious um and you know don't be intimidated mm -hmm. well certainly I feel less intimidated by all the tech now, thanks to uh, all of that amazing uh, stuff. I'm so glad people are out there uh, braving the waves and the seasickness to get that technology out there. Uh, Emily, any any final questions, any thoughts uh, before we, we wrap up here? Uh, just a huge shout out to, to you, Emery. We have a lot of new fans of our AUVs, which is, um, I, I'm sure as someone who is a fan of robots, somehow easy to do for, for you. You can definitely tell how excited and passionate about uh, these uh, incredible pieces of science uh, that you get to work with here. Uh, but I definitely think that we have a bunch of new fans of, of our AUVs out there. So um, huge shout out to, to you. So um, if we can get a whole bunch of W's and GG's yeah. in the chat for, for Emery there for, um, Help and do some awesome science mm -hmm. out there in the deep sea. Yeah, thank you so much, Emery. Yeah, again, uh, in, in the chat, let's sound off right now for uh, thank you so much, Emery, for for taking the time. Uh, great job, Cassie and uh, Susan, for answering all the questions coming in on your social media feeds. Thank you, as always, Emily, uh, for fielding the amazing questions from our from our audience there, and uh, for giving me enough bandwidth to be able to fumble around on these little <laughs> buttons over here so we could uh, do the show. Uh, Emery, any final final thoughts for everybody? Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate this opportunity to tell you guys about this. Um, the more you know, the more you know, you know what's out there. So I'm excited that hopefully maybe it inspired somebody to be join, come join us on the boats. Awesome. That'd be great. Cool. Well, thank you so much. We look forward to more science out there. Uh, check out um, behind me here is uh, one of Emery's uh, um, uh, scientific children out there going out there uh, doing the doing the work of mapping and behind Susan here this whole time we've been having this uh, new animation there from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's team of the canyon so go check out uh, on Ambari social media feeds that really cool new uh, the really cool new animation that just uh, uh, came out here today we're, we're showing it to the world so thank you so much everyone with that uh, we hope to deep see you all again soon here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute social media feeds. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks, Emery, Emily, Susan, Cassie. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.